Well, you know, I don't mind requests, Arisal. I don't. Like, as long as I don't have to go looking for papers and whatnot, like, it's not a big deal. So, here's the uh, link if y'all want it. Um, you can get it, like I said, um, by clicking on Scholar, and then it's right there. So, and again, if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be under in the, uh, the link will be in the uh, notes. <sighs> okay. So, we're talking about Crane and the Mark of the Mental now by Andrea Raimondi. <sighs> now, let me, you know what's funny? I'm going to take off the trigger warning. Although I suspect, you know, I bet more people like hop into the uh, stream. We could do a. Oh, I can't. Even, since I'm gonna change it, I can. You know what? Throw this in there. There we go. So now people will get the title in the uh, title. Okay. Anywho. And as always, my first time reading it, feel free to ask whatever you want along the way. I will try to make sense of things. Brentano. Sug Brentano's suggestion that intentionality is the mark of the mental is typically spelled out in terms of the thesis that all and only mental states are intentional. Henceforth, Brentano's thesis. Okay, just so everyone knows, being um, it, what it is to be thinking is to be thinking about something. That's generally how... Um, people talk about intentionality. The fact that you have an aboutness about your thought, you always are thinking about something, that's intentionality. And that's kind of what uh, Brentano is getting at here, is that what it is to be mental is to be directed at something in the world. There's an aboutness to your thought, and that's what it is to be mental. An influential objection is that intentionality is not necessary for mentality. Putative, non-intentional mental states are moods. Okay, so a mood is not about anything. You can just be in a mood. And qualitative states, so like you can just feel like happy, I guess. Hi, Lala. Oh, it wasn't even at me, Dag Nabbit. Well, tell Lala I say hi. Some seek to rebut these objections. However, the focus of this paper is on the other half of Brentano's thesis, the claim that intentionality suffices for mentality. My starting point is a very popular characterization of intentionality, most not notably defended by Crane. Okay, so that's why it was Crane and this. According to it, an intentional state possesses two distinctive features, directedness towards an object and an aspectual shape. I have no idea what the aspectual shape is, but like I was saying earlier, the quite often what they're talking about intentionality, what it is to be conscious is directedness towards an object, something outside of you. Ness argues that on this characterization, some non-mental states come out as intentional. Crane replies that the problem can be solved by cashing out the notion of intentionality in representational terms. I maintain that this view does not provide a satisfactory reply to Ness. First, I distinguish between two notions of representation. Then I show that A, an account based on the first notion is inconsistent with the claim that intentionally suffices for mentality. Yes, they do love big words. And B, an account based on the second notion trivializes that claim. After addressing various objections, I conclude that if intentionality is analyzed in representational terms, Brentano's thesis loses the privileged status that it it is thought to have. Um, you want to like the difference between this paper and the last one. The last paper was futzing with big ideas, but it did so in small terms. This one is dealing with just what it is to think, which in some sense is a much smaller term. It's something we all deal with, not the uh, like war crimes of the last paper. This paper is talking about what it is to think, which is a much smaller thing because it's something we all do, and so they have to use bigger words to make themselves uh, to make it sound impressive. Ness versus Crane. Crane finds two distinctive features in the concept of intentionality, directness upon an object and aspectual shape. He describes how they are exemplified by paradigmatic instances of intentional states, in particular, thoughts. Directness shows up in that all thought is about something. Aspectual shape shows up 
in that whenever an object is thought of, it is thought of in a certain way. If you think the singer of Rocket Man and I think of the thinker, the singer of Sacrifice, the same object figures in our thoughts under different aspects. That is, the same object is thought of, in one case, Qua, singer of Rocket Man, and in the other, Qua, singer of Sacrifice. Hence, Crane endorses C. All and only intentional states have directness and a spectral shape. Okay, so they're saying, look, if we're all talking about um, Elton John, you think of Elton John differently than I think of Elton John, but we're both thinking of Elton John. Um, I'm already annoyed, but whatever. It's cool. <laughs> Moreover, Crane observes that it is non-characteristic of directedness that intentional states can be directed upon non-existent objects, as when you think of golden mountains. So, yeah, you can think of things that don't exist, and you can be directed towards them even though they don't they're objects but they don't exist so they're non-existent objects and uh, there's one thing Brentano talks about is non-existent things oh yeah these are a lot of big words in this one according to crane the role of the concept of intentionality is to distinguish mental from non-mental states this role is captured by the conjunction of two claims first that intentionality is a concept which applies to all mental phenomena second that intentionality is characteristic of the mental alone. Briefly, Crane endorses Brentano's thesis, that is, the conjunction of ne the necessity thesis and the sufficiency thesis. All the necessity is all mental states are intentional, and sufficient only mental states are intentional. Ness argues that, that C is inconsistent with ST. So what was C? C is all and only intentional states have directedness and aspectual shape. So, okay. Certain non-mental phenomena, such as physical dispositions, exemplify the characteristic features of intentional states. So that means physical dispositions are mental in that case. His example involves an object O that is disposed to attract pretzel-shaped pieces of metal, metal pretzels for short, despite there being none. Hence, O's disposition is directed towards non-existent objects. You know, you could say that, like, maybe the last of a species, it is directed towards attracting other members of its species but none of them exist okay moreover o's disposition possesses an aspectual shape for o is disposed to attract metal pretzels in a certain way gravitationally electrically etc that is metal pretzels are objects of o's disposition qua things with a certain mass or qua things with a certain charge crane replies that this is that I'm losing it. Crane replies that it is the concept of representation that will distinguish intentional phenomena from that from the other phenomena Ness talks about. He writes, I should have introduced the idea of intentionality initially as representation and then shown how direct directedness and aspectual shape are features of representation in the relevant sense. Crane endorses a representational account of intentionality. All and only intentional states are representational and, as such, they can represent non-existent objects and they have aspectual shape. Since a physical disposition does not represent its manifest manifestation, that is what it is directed upon, this account is consistent with ST. I contend that Crane's reply cannot meet Ness's challenge. First, I claim that there are two versions of the representational account. Then I argue that neither of them provides a satisfactory reply to Ness. Okay, so it's like in your mind, you have to be able to have a representation of the world and the representation has to involve being directed at stuff. <laughs> and it has to be unique is the second thing. So basically, how do you... Yeah, I'm sorry. I went like in the opposite direction of what we were doing. We were talking about things that everyone understands, but they're very big and scary. Something no nobody understands, but they're really unimportant. Um, so basically, there's two accounts here. It's saying, look, one person is saying what it is to be have a mind, to be mental, is to be able to have a representation of things and the representation be directed at the world and be in a certain way, a certain aspect. So if I think of Elton John, I've got a representation of Elton John and the way, the specific way in which I'm thinking of Elton John. And if you think of Elton John, you also have a representation and you're thinking of the same object, Elton John, but it's not done in the same way that I'm doing it. And so you've got the directedness and the particular aspect of uh, how you're thinking of Elton John. Well, they're trying to define how, well, what is mind. And so that's what they're trying to do here. 
and this author saying that they haven't gotten it right. And so if you thought that intentionality, that this directedness and this certain aspect of how you are doing it is what it is to be uh, conscious or have mentality, then you are worried that this author disagrees that this will get there. So they're trying to define mind is what um, they're trying to do here. And I mean, why is that important anyway? I don't know. It's what people like to talk about, what it is to be conscious. <coughs> More seriously, it matters for um, cognitive neuroscience. What is the brain actually doing? Because cognitive neuroscience needs to know the right sort of phenomena to be uh, studying. And so these sorts of papers get read in cognitive uh, neuroscience circles to talk about where, what sort of structures they need to look for in the brain. And so if you want to talk about, um, yeah, so these, thing, th these things are related. So that's why it, it more seriously matters is that the science actually follows the philosophy here. Okay, objective and subjective representation. The word representation is ambiguous, at least it is used in connection with issues pertaining to the philosophy of mind, at least as it is used with re respect to the philosophy of mind. Its ambiguity can be illustrated by considering a familiar scenario. There is a possible world where my brain was placed in a vat and has been receiving sensory stimulations from a machine ever since. The brain's stream of consciousness is subjectively indistinguishable from my actual stream. So this is like you're in the matrix. So brain in the vat, you're in the matrix. And so your brain can't tell the difference between being in real life or being in the matrix. For example, whenever the machine is in state S sub A, the brain undergoes an experience subjectively indistinguishable from the experience I undergo when I see an apple. So yeah, so you've got the matrix apple and then you see the apple and you can't tell the difference. Thus, as Kriegel stresses, the brain's uh, matrix apple caused appleish visual experiences. Experience represents what my experience does, that is an apple or something that looks like an apple. And on the other hand, since the matrix apple is what causes and or stably covaries with the brain's appleish visual experiences, the brain experiences uh, the experience of being an apple. Kadir says, is it weird that I make a concerted effort to think as little as possible, or does this make you crazy? No, that makes you basically human. I don't really try to think more than I need to. Um, it's mostly a waste of time to put extra thought into things that you don't need to be thinking about. So, um, now there's questions, why do I do the things I do, like read papers on Twitch and talk about them? That's a different problem, but you don't have to, uh, you, I don't expect anyone else to like do the stuff I do and you don't have to think any harder than you should <laughs> oh, yeah there's no need to like put extra effort in there's plenty of other things to be doing also you don't need to think harder most of the time of course sometimes you do but not always okay so yeah so when you're in the matrix and it shows you an apple you have the experience of having an apple experience Okay, we may characterize this experience both as representing, meaning presenting an apple or something that looks like an apple, and as representing, meaning tracking the experience. So you're tracking the experience of an apple. Uh, you're, but your mind races? Well, go smoke some weed or something. I don't know. Uh, slow it down. I don't know how, to, how, you, how you do that, but I mean, you can do it. I don't know how you in particular can do it. Um, go find something to focus on. And I can't tell you how to focus. You just do focus. Borrowing Kriegel's terminology, I call the two kinds of representation, subjective and objective representation, representation, respectively S and O representation. Yeah, meditation. Yeah, I was about to just go say, go hang out with Evolve yourself. That might help. This distinction concerns only conscious representational states. And my shoutouts are still not going, and I'm annoyed about this. Why are my shoutouts not showing up? Is Are they getting hidden, hidden here? Let me try something. That's so weird. They were working just before stream, so I don't know what's going on. Yo, discipline is extremely hard. 
So, you know, that takes effort. It does take effort to maintain discipline. Okay. The distinction concerns only conscious representational states. So one of them is that you have the, you are presenting something that looks like an apple. Like so you've got the idea of an apple and that's just like sort of an ab abstract representation. And the other one is that you are actually directing your attention at that representation. Stream gods are very f fickle. So S representation, that's where you are the, so, okay. Like S1 is where you're just sort of abstractly uh, considering it. S representation instantiates phenomenal properties characterized by their phenomenal character, what it's likeness. There is an Apple-ish way it is like for the brain to have its experiences. This accounts for why it is S it is representing an apple. So you can have the experiences of an apple in sort of the abstract sense that you can have like apple experiences. On the other hand, O representational states instantiate tracking properties, that is, properties that detect or carry information about environmental items. These properties can be accounted for in many ways. Let me mention two, causal covariation and teleological approaches. According to the former, a state S tracks X if and only if X causes S under the right conditions. Instead of a, instead a teleological approach holds that a state S of a system tracks X in, version, in virtue of S's correspondence with external conditions conferring the right kind of adaptive advantage on the system. Okay, so look, you can track things in the world. That's all they're saying. There's two, there's different ways to do it. The, there's either the right conditions or the thing in the world is causing you to track it uh, under some sort of external condition. I don't know why. Kriegel maintains that the two concepts of representation are thoroughly distinguished. There are conceptually possible scenarios where representation varies in the, the objective sense, but not in the subjective sense and vice versa. And one ones where representation occurs in the objective sense, but not in the subjective sense and vice versa. This four way conceptual separability of O and S representation does not rule out a reductive account according to which it is metaphysically necessary that if certain properties of S representation, that is having an Apple experience are instantiated, then certain properties of O representation are also instantiated. That is where you are looking at the Apple in some sense. It's not just that there is a representation of it, but that you are directed towards it. However, for our purposes, it, it, it suffices to hold that the two concepts of representation are distinguished whether or not they pick out the same properties. Okay, yeah, so why should you be directed at something in, in some sense versus picking out the experience of it? This is weird, though. I mean, why would you really separate these things? I don't really know. But they say you can. I don't actually believe that these are all separable. They just say you can. Um, and I guess other people say you can, too, but... I'm not so sure that this is, uh, I'm with Kriegel here that you can do these different sort of things. I, I actually dislike this whole approach that you're separating out your attentional uh, stuff versus your representational stuff. I don't know if they can really be separated because how you look at an apple, like, is there really some sort of abstract, um, experience of the apple without a directedness at it? Seems questionable. Um, for example, Purple says, for example, seems just like memory and seconds regarding or using it. Yeah, I think this is part of it. Like the memory is the sort of representational structure and the second is how you interact with the representational structure. So that would be memory because where else would the uh, representational structure be? So, but I'm not like that you can describe it this way does not mean that this is actually a good way to break it down. Because, like, I can break down, you can break down a lot of stuff in different ways. You can talk about the physics of it, but the physics of it doesn't have anything to do with the consciousness at this point. So it's like, well, I can talk about that too, but is that fundamental to consciousness? Probably not. Like, you can talk about, like, the electrons. The electrons are not going to be, unless you're a panpsychist, but the electrons are not going to be uh, particularly relevant in this discussion. And I, could I talk about them? Yes, I could talk about them. So yeah, Kriegel maintains that the two concepts of representation are thoroughly distinguished. I don't know if I buy that Kri what Kriegel says right here. Like that could just be wrong. Like why am I taking Kriegel's word for it? 
If the two concepts are distinguished, the phrase representational states in Crane's reply must be disambiguated. Accordingly, I shall test two versions of the representational account, one that caches out intentionality in terms of O representation, and one that caches it out it out in terms of s representation an account of intentionality is adequate for crane's purposes if and only if it is consistent with a brintano's thesis b the idea that intentional states can be directed towards non-existent objects and c the idea that intentional states have a spectral shape i argue that neither the o nor the s representational ac account can meet all these requirements as the problem with the former account is more obvious i begin by briefly discussing it then i focus more extensively on the s representational account so here's the thing the idea that you can that it is necessary for this uh, author to pull these two representational accounts apart if you can't do that i suspect the their argument doesn't work so they're relying very heavily on kriegel the, that Kriegel maintains this. Now we'd have to go back and see what Kriegel's argument is here to see if this is right. This Kriegel 2014. I suspect I would disagree with Kriegel's argument and therefore I would say that this analysis is sort of misguided. That doesn't mean the author is wrong in this area. It just means I wouldn't do it this way and so I wouldn't, I'd have other problems, not these problems. But like, how do you describe and think like what it is to be in the mind? You might actually think that there is something as Popple says, memory and then what you do about it. And this is what I mean when you're talking about cognitive science. Is there memory and what you do about it? And are you going to look in, in the brain for structures of memory and then what we do about it? You could look for stuff like that. Okay, intentionality as objective representation. Let me start by considering the account of intentionality based on objective concept on the objective concept of representation. A. All and only intentional states are objectively representational. Objective representation states can objectively represent non-existent objects. And C. Whenever an object is objectively represented, it is objectively represented in a certain way. For argument's sake, I assume that non-mental dispositions do not track their manifestations their manifestations. Thus, R0 does not make such states intentional, thus providing a reply to Ness. Yeah, just in general, if it's a not mental thing, you do not have something that has an objective representation of something else. But again, like a computer clearly could have a, a representational state of something else, because that's what, you know, like a computer system might do. Unfortunately, right, so author says, unfortunately, however, there is a serious problem with the very first claim of the account. The claim that all and only intentional states are objectively representational is inconsistent with ST. To illustrate, consider a biological state implicated in the regulation of certain biological processes. One might, one might be muscle spindles. These are receptors within the body of a muscle whose responses to change in the muscle stretch play a fundamental role in regarding the control contraction of the muscle and generally speaking in contributing to proprioception proprioception is when you like feel yourself so like if you like push against your own finger there's no other thing like you're not feeling anything else you feel how much you're pushing and that's sort of a unique thing so you can feel how you are oriented in your hand by how it feels and that's proprioception and so how you like make a fist is a uh what you feel there and what you know about your hand positioning when you make a fist is something unique compared to like other sorts of perception where you're finding out something in the world. Okay. The muscle spindle is in a quiescent state where the muscle is contracted. It is in activated state when the muscle is stretched, increasing its first firing rate proportionally to the muscle stretch. How, hence, the internal state of the muscle spindle tracks and is supposed to track both on causal covariation theories and on teleosemantic theories muscle stretches yes yeah, so your muscles correspond to the state of your hand that is it tracks the instantiation of certain properties of movements of the muscle therefore the internal state of the muscle spindle o represents such properties but if that state is o represent like objective objectively representational and being an o representative state is the state and sufficient condition for being an intentional state a paradigmatic non-mental state comes out as being intention. Yeah, so you've got a physical system that tracks a larger system. So if you have like the like your the state of your hand, the muscles in your hand track the overall shape of your hand and therefore it is a it makes a representation of it and your hand is not 
conscious. Um, I don't know if I buy this at all. Like, why would you say the muscle states track the hand states? The muscle states only track the hand states in a wider selection of the uh, how you understand they're connected to each other. But how they're connected to each other is not the muscle states themselves. So I immediately say, th I'm calling bullshit immediately on this one. Because, like, look, my hand, I can feel it. And I know, like, what my fist is like. But, like, what my fist is like is independent. It's greater than the sum of the parts of all the muscle contractions. contractions because the sum of the muscle contractions don't doesn't inherently they're unrelated to each other in terms of the uh, shape of my hand. The shape of my hand has to do with the muscle contractions oriented in a certain way. And only, and that is not, and that's over and above the muscle contractions themselves. Huh. So like, I immediately am calling bull on this because I'm like, that is not a representation of my fist. It just isn't. The muscle spindles on their own are not a representation of my fist without um, the greater superstructure of knowing where the muscle spindles are. And that's a concept in my head where they are. Okay. The Continuing, I guess. The difficulty with the objective concept of representation forces Crane to rely on the subjective concept. Well, no. The difficulty with the what you just said, the author just said, forces you to the author to go to the subjective concept. So I don't know if this what this uh, argument here holds up. Puppel says, and we have to calibrate on what really happens physically in loops. What's a loop? I don't know what you mean by loop. There. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Let me know. Okay. Intentionality as subjective representation. Here the S representational account of here is the S representational account of intentionality. Ugh. All and only intentional states are subjectively representational. That's S representational. B S representational states can S represent non existent objects. C whenever an object is S represented, it is S represented in a certain way. Sure. Since there are intentional states that do not seem to instantiate phenomenal properties, um, for example, thoughts and standing and standing propositional attitudes, one might modify RSA as follows. All and only intentional states are either S representational states or states that are not S representational and are grounded in S representational states. So like these are the moods. If you're not directed at anything, you can have a sort of a subjective mood and that's fine. So, are a star is for the conjunction of all these things. They claim that state states that they are not S representational, henceforth non S representational states, are grounded in the representational ones, can be cashed out in different ways by appealing to dispositions, functional relations, or acts of conscious interpretation. I assume that one of these will do. Yeah, if you need to have a subjective thing, you have a conscious interpretation. Puppel says, we ask hand to move and then see how far it really moves and move it again. Um, yes, we can do it in that way, but the author specifically said proprioception, which is the hand feedback. So we're not seeing how the hand feedbacks. It's the, they said the proprioceptive stuff. So if you make a fist and you can feel your fist by your fist, it's not that you're moving it and you're seeing it, it's that you, you're getting the feedback immediately by the, uh, the reflexive feedback on your fist and see the author was trying to be clever there and get away from having the um this sort of like superstructure or the conscious like oh i move my hand and i see it and then i understand it they wanted it to be immediate and so they were using the proprioceptive thing which is uh you know it's getting a lot of play in philosophical examples and i don't think people use it very well so but yeah I, that's not to say the author misused it here. I don't think they did, but I'm just saying it's, uh, this is what the clever philosophy people are doing nowadays is they're using proprioceptive examples to get away from, uh, using the mental representation of the hand. <coughs> All right. Continuing. Yeah, that's just touch compared to sight. Um, 
the idea is that there's less um like processing going on like it's immediate now i don't know if that's true but like the idea is that you're getting immediate feedback and you don't have to like think about where things are in space um you might be right it might the two things might be equivalent um but that's sort of like the claim that the flaw i think the author is trying well that's the position i think the author is taking is that you're not thinking about it in some representational way uh outside of just like the representation of the hand itself so you're not doing like a, you have a concept of the hand also yeah i mean like i said this is a uh, philosopher's example like the sort of thing a philosopher would kind of come up with so you don't have to like rely on multiple systems Okay, so basically if you have a subjective representation, then you know, you've got some sort of disposition in your mind, an act of conscious interpretation, something. And the author continues, note that many theorists think that there are unconscious perceptions, for example, in blind sight and subliminal perception, which are non-subjective representational and are not supposed to be grounded in some sort of representational state. For argument's sake, I ignore this problem. And they say it's a problem for Kriegel. A physical disposition is neither a subjective representational nor not subjective representational and grounded in a subjective representational state. Yeah, it's just a physical thing. It's not the subjectivity here. Consequently, according to the representa a subjective representation, that disposition is not intentional. Ness's challenge is met. Nevertheless, yeah, so if you've got a physical thing, it's not the mental subjective thing. Nevertheless, I argue that both these, oh, so these accounts trivialize the point, and this has a problematic consequences on the view that intentionality marks off and unifies the mental. To illustrate, I draw an analogy with a possible reply to Ness's objection. That objection shows that characterizing intentionality as directedness and aspectual shape conflicts with ST. Uh, so that's sufficient, that's the uh, claim above that this is all that is there is to mind. Suppose that someone replies that those two features are intended to describe what is what is presented to a particular mind as such and how it is presented to it. Accordingly, all and only those phenomena possessing directedness and aspectual shape are intentional, provided that they concern a mind. Although a physical disposition possesses such features, it does not count as intentional, for it does not concern a mind. Okay, so when it's presented to a mind it has um directedness in an aspectual shape fine this reply spells out intentionality in explicitly mental terms although it is consistent with nt and st it makes intentionality trivially sufficient to mentality oh it's they're saying it's circular if you're saying this is what it is for a mind to do it then of course it's circular hence as briefly noted by ness it does not count as a satisfactory solution to Ness's challenge. I argue that similar remarks apply to the S representational account. So yeah, if you're saying that you, a mind needs to be directed and have an aspectual thing, that's not defining what a mind is, that's just sort of describing it, but not limiting what it is. And the author says, if you have a subjective representation, the f I bet they're saying, well, look, you can't call it subjective then, because that will make it circular. All right. To repeat, the latter account holds that the subjective representation is the criterion of intentionality. Hence, it spells out intentionality in terms that mention facts about the instantiation of phenomenal properties. Is there a way to cash out them in non-mental terms? No. Phenomenal properties are properties of phenomenally conscious experiences. By definition, these are experiences of, that conscious minds undergo. Briefly, phenomenal properties are properties of mental states by definition. This is true even for those who think that phenomenal properties are instantiated in virtue of appropriate relations between mind, brain, and external objects and properties. This view has no bearing on the claim that if phenomenal properties are instantiated, they are instantiated by a mind. Yeah, so if it's subjective and you're defining it as such, that means it is already presented to a mind. As a consequence, the S representational account has it that intentionality can only be cashed out in explicitly mental terms. In turn, this result in the trivialization of it, it results in the trivialization of the claim that this is all that there is to intentionality. Such a trivialization is not an acceptable price to pay, at least for the advocates of the view that intentionality is the mark of the mental. Indeed, if they want 
the claim that this is the the claim that this is what it is to contribute to the idea that intentionality marks off and unifies the mental they ought to want st to claim that it's intentionality to be true in some interesting non-trivial sense okay so you have to have an um, you can't do it if you're going to say that you know everything is subjective but subjectivity always implies that there's already a mind there that it is subjective of that it's the way the mind is doing it okay Three replies. In this section, I discuss three potential replies to the trivialization problem. Although I focus on the subjective representation, my observations apply, mutatis mutandis, to um, the restricted version. This is the non-restricted version, whatever, though. First reply. If Crane gives an argument in, in favor of the uh, representational, sub subjective representational that is independent of the discussion of Ness's objection, it will not trivialize. There is nothing wrong per se in characterizing intentionality explicitly subjective representational in subjectively representation mental terms, so one may argue. How could Crane do that? First, he could find a feature or set of features F shared by all and only intentional states. Then he could give an argument to the effect that F is possessed only by S representational states and non-S representational states grounded in representational ones. He could finally conclude that all and only intentional states are either subjectively representational states or non-subjectively representational states that are grounded in it and the subjectively representational ones. The natural candidates for F are directedness and aspectual shape, but Ness's objection makes them unavailable so long as it is not neutralized. Are there other candidates? Yeah, so you can't reuse the same stuff you're trying to explain anymore. Ness discusses some proposals that attempt to define intentionality on the basis of linguistic features of intentional state reports, and he convincingly argues that they are inadequate. One may think that another candidate is S representation, uh, is subjective representation, but this pr proposal begs the question, as the target of my objection is the S representational account of intentionality. If there are further candidates, they are not obvious, and the burden of proof is squarely on Crane's side. Yeah, so... Second reply, a crucial assumption in my trivialization objection is the popular claim that, to use Chalmers' words, phenomenal properties are by definition properties of mental states. One may deny this and argue that although phenomenal properties are instantiated by mental states, this is not true by definition. Given the great popularity of the assumption at stake, anyone willing to deny it must provide strong reasons in support of their move. One such reason may come from the thesis that mentality is defined in terms of phenomenal consciousness. Or, more generally, any thesis according to which phenomenal consciousness has some sort of priority over mentality. But then Brentano's thesis will ultimately rest upon a substantial and highly controversial position concerning the relation between mentality and consciousness. That is, the latter position unexpectedly turns out to be the bedrock assumption underlying Brentano's thesis. No trivialization occurs, but the price to pay is committing to another position requiring independent scrutiny. Yeah, so I mean, this is saying, look, intentionality requires consciousness, but that's what you were trying to explain to begin with. And so you've reversed the whole thing, but that means you have to explain more to explain something that you thought you were, that was simpler. People thought that you were just explaining intentionality, what it was for the mind to be about something, but now you need all of consciousness to explain that. And that's sort of like, well, you can flip it around, but now you have to explain something that's even harder to explain with some, to explain something simpler. So this is why the author thinks that's not a good idea. Incidentally, note that on a certain interpretation of Brentano's work, Brentano's thesis was regarded by Brentano as derivative from the claim that all and only mental states are non-trivially conscious. If this interpretation is correct, then the view endorsed by the real historical Brentano may not be so far from the view I have just discussed. Yeah, so maybe Brentano thought this himself. That'd be kind of cool. But it just seems like it's a... Uh, that would be putting the cart before the horse. The whole point of explaining intentionality was that we were trying to find something to look for to to make consciousness easier to understand. And if you don't do that, then what's the point of uh, discussing it, really? You're just going to have to go find out what consciousness is anyway. Third reply, Strawson. Strawson suggests a non-reductive model of analysis on which a concept is placed in a network of connected concepts such that the function of each concept could be properly understood only by grasping the connections with the others. On this connectionist model, there is no reason to be worried if, in the process of tracing connections from one concept to another, we pass through the starting concept. Therefore, trivialization is not a threat. 
The problem here is that the connectionist view, the connectionist move involves a weakening of Brentano's thesis in the sense that it features an in interpretation of this thesis that does not fit with how it is currently understood by many authors, setting aside exegetical issues concerning the real historical Brentano. That is, as the thesis according to which intentionality specifies the nature of or somehow prior to mentality. So yeah, if you are going to say that you can explain these concepts, but only in a network. But then, of course, you have to explain, explain the whole network to explain consciousness or mentality. But that's not, again, that's missing the point of uh, talking about intentionality as what is fundamental to being a uh, mind. So then you have a whole network of things. For instance, Kriegel maintains that Brentano's thesis involves the view that the underlying nature of mentality is intentionality. Similarly, Crane says that Intentionality is the essence of mentality. Locatelli and Wilson hold that recent views inspired by Brentano's work promise to offer an integrated account of the mind in terms of intentional states. Finally, Texter stresses that the contemporary discussion of Brentano's thesis assumes the concept of intentionality can be mastered independently of the concept of the mental. As I understand them, these passages show that Brentano's thesis is treated as stating something stronger than a mere connection to interdefinable concepts. Therefore, if one had hoped Brentano's thesis could offer a way of marking off and unifying the mental along the aforementioned terms, then the indicated connectionist account does not deliver. Conclusion I have argued that neither the subjective nor the objective notion of representation provides a satisfactory reply to Ness's objection. On the other on the one hand, the objective notion is inconsistent with Brentano's thesis. On the other hand, the subjective notion trivializes one half of this thesis. The price to pay to resist my trivialization objection is either a prior commitment to a substantial and controversial view regarding the relation between mentality and consciousness, or a significant weakening of Brentano's thesis. Hence, one way or another, so long as it is understood in representational terms, this thesis ends up losing the privileged status it is thought to have in philosophical discussions of mental phenomena. Okay, now I'm happy with this because it was so dry compared to the previous paper that I have somewhat forgotten some of the previous paper. <laughs> I mean, basically, this is a cute, not why well, I don't want to really call it too cute. It's a it's a short little straightforward argument saying, hey, look, this idea about intentionality is, um, you know, it's a cleaning the palate, Aristotle cleaning. We were cleaning the palate. We had all this heavy food earlier. We needed to clean the palate to like move on with things. And so that's what this did. So this has wiped our mind clean. We talked about intentionality, what it is to be about the world. And if you need representation to talk about intentionality, what this author seems to say, it says there are problems with intentionality. Now, the specific problems you can get into, it seems that um, I don't know how much you like them. Like this is what they were talking about, these specific problems. But it's like, look, if you have representation, where is the representation? Is it objective? Well, objective things seem like it could be in other places. I kind of argue with that. What is the representation? Is is the thing itself the representation of itself? Kind of and kind of not. That's what they were talking about, the hand. Like are the muscles the representation of the hand? Kind of, but not really. Um... So I had a problem with that. But then if you need a subjective representation of like what it is to be thinking about the world, you've already begged the question, basically, because if it is a subjective representation, subjectivity implies mental state already. And so you've begged the question by intentional, if you already assume intentionally as subjective, where the subjective is uh, in the definition. So that's the question. If you think that intentionality requires, uh, like, to what it is to think about things requires representation, you're going to have a bad time until you come up with a better concept of representation. And that's, I think, what the takeaway is here. It's that how are you actually going to talk about representation in the mind um, in a sensible way? <laughs>